Hey, hey, everybody, welcome to That Expert Show, where you help run the show. I'm Anna Canzano. I am so excited to talk with our guest tonight about professional modeling. Maybe you or someone that you know is interested in going into modeling. Maybe there's children in your life who you're thinking about, you know, they have a potential modeling career. Well, Sanjana Ravi, our guest tonight, is just uh, reaching this new level of becoming a professional model, and I've had the pleasure of watching her work her way up to this point. Uh, she joins, a, uh, jo joins us live right now from Davis, California, to talk with us and give us some insights into this process of becoming a professional model. Sanjana, thank you so much for being on that expert show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really a pleasure to watch you work so hard. And I know there is a tremendous amount of work and dedication that goes into this. Um, for those of us who are watching us live via the Oregonian, we welcome your viewership. If you have somebody in your life that you think this episode would apply to, go ahead and share it right now on your socials with your friends. And Sanjana, um, I wonder if we could begin with you by just talking about how long ago this process Process of trying to break into a really competitive industry. How long ago did it begin? Yeah, so I actually applied for modeling agencies way back in 2020, of February of 2020, and I got signed to an agency in San Francisco. But that was right at the same time COVID hit. So there was absolutely no work. I was signed to an agency. I was getting congratulated left and right, but not working, which was just embarrassing. But over time, I got, I think, one shoot with that agency, but they were just, a lot of the agents got furloughed. COVID just completely wiped out the agency, but I was applying myself through their um, casting website. And come November of 2020, my new agency actually found me through something else that I was applying for, I think. And they reached out to me and I signed with them over Zoom as everything else was happening over Zoom. And it really just started there. I think my first professional shoot was actually March of 2021, and that was with Sephora. And that same week, last minute, I got a shoot with Nike. So I would say the actual career started more 2021, but I was more signed to agencies in 2020, but COVID just put a big halt on everything. That's even crazier to think that this is a career that you've eventually, you know, eventually launched through such a strange time. Um, as you were trying to break into the business and you were evaluating different agencies, uh, how did you wind up deciding to go with the agency that you chose? I definitely think there was a lot of trial and error there. At, at the time, I just really wanted to get signed to an agency. I wanted to start pursuing modeling and it's more so where you get accepted. And the first agency I ended up with, they were a really big agency. They had girls in L.A. They were doing shoots with Calvin Klein, just really big companies. And they had so many models already there. They didn't really have time to take on a new person and really build them and grow them. But the second agency that reached out to me, they are so amazing. They're a smaller agency, so they can really focus on the talent that they have. Whereas my first agency, if you're not kind of the five foot nine, like 24 inch waist they don't really have a lot of room for you. So I think definitely for me, it was trial and error. I kind of messed up the first time and took a chance on someone who wanted to take a chance on me. Hmm. That's interesting. Let's talk about that because I think a lot of people think right off the bat that to become a model of any type that you do have to be five foot nine with, is it a 24 inch waist? E. <laughs> yeah. So with that, I think modeling has definitely changed, but a lot of the bigger agencies typically tend to go for girls who fit that typical cat category. So I know Wilhelmina Models, they're a really big talent agency and they do amazing work. But if you look at their application website, the minimum height requirement is I think either five foot eight, five foot nine or five foot 10, which I'm five foot five. So my application wouldn't, ha wouldn't have even gone through. And I think the biggest issue with going for big named agencies is you think, oh, I'm signed to this big agency, I'm going to get good work. And it's kind of like almost clout chasing when you just sign with a big agency for the namesake. But then you could be signed to this big agency and get absolutely no work, make no money and not have gotten a single shoot. So I think it's really important to consider aiming for a more diverse talent agency for sure. That's really interesting. And what are you seeing just in the last couple of years in terms of 
um, the body types that are, you know, getting gigs as models. I, I, I personally think that there's a lot of that that is currently changing. I agree. And I think it's actually great, too, because I know some people do have kind of this thing of, oh, I'm just a diversity pick. I don't think that's necessarily how it is. I think there's just a lot more inclusivity. There's a lot more people who are open to going for different body types, going for different hairstyles, different skin tones. And I think that just comes with the change in society and everything as well. But um, as for, I think, with this change, for me personally, I know that a lot of the time I was chosen because I'm Indian. But even five, four years back, that would have never been the case. I mean, having someone who's Indian, uh, kind of like the girl next door look would have never been something that people are interested in. But if you look at commercial modeling versus runway modeling, I think that's the main key. A lot of the five foot nine, really skinny girls, they're where you would see for Tommy Hilfiger, Calvin Klein, Abercrombie and Fitch. I think that's actually changing now as well. But there's more, there's more beauty, there's more um, like Target and H&M, they want people who are diverse. And I think it's because they're targeting an audience. So you have to kind of have models that look like your target audience as well. That's um, a really interesting uh, piece of insight there. Let's back up a little bit and talk about the process of even before you sign with an agency, like the amount of work that goes into getting the photographs that you would need to present to agencies and to submit to them. What is that process like? Is that all out of pocket? Are there shortcuts or hacks that you can figure out on how to get those photos um, so that you have a portfolio to even present in the first place? Yeah, and I actually have an interesting story. So I have a friend who she signed to a big agency and she has a huge portfolio with tons of work and it is expensive. You have to meet with different photographers and you have to kind of figure out a look that works for you and works for them. And Oddly enough, she actually hasn't had that much work because obviously her agency is much bigger. Whereas with me, I actually submitted my personal photos that I take with friends that I use for Instagram. Because I think these days they want to see your personality. They don't really care. A lot of agencies, they don't care as much about your looks. They don't care as much about, you know, having this like this persona of looking the part and I think they care more about your personality so even fun photos that you take for Instagram you can actually use that now as digitals and you can use those kind of photos to get signed to agencies I think iPhone pictures are great you don't need to go buy an expensive camera you don't need a photo you don't need to you know you don't need a photographer you literally just need your iPhone and a bare face, no makeup, like they want to see you for you and the right person is actually going to prefer to pick you because you're natural and because you're taking an iPhone photo. Okay, that's kind of mind blowing to me because when I think about somebody who wants to break into this business, I think about all of the startup and overhead costs that I assumed were involved. So you're saying that that's not necessarily the case, like you can submit photos that you know, I, I guess I think about people airbrushing their photos and making everything look just right before they submit it. Yeah. And it's it's actually obvious these days. So I just did a shoot with Rare Beauty and they were kind of just explaining to me how like they want someone who kind of fits this natural look. They want someone who embodies what their company promotes. I mean, Selena Gomez, she's so beautiful. She promotes loving yourself. She promotes kindness. She promotes all of these things. They want models who embody that. And I've spoken to casting directors who literally say we've turned down girls because of things like filler or obvious editing and those kind of things, which is very shocking. I mean, for me growing up being just your average looking girl, average size, like not ugly, but not like the most beautiful, you know, in the room, like just like a normal girl hearing that was like, wow. So you guys actually just want normal girls with the personality. The way I actually got one of my gigs was from a vlog I did on YouTube. They said, we loved your personality and that's why we chose you instead of this other girl. And I was shocked. And yeah, you don't need to face tune. It's obvious if you face tune, you don't need to get like, I mean, I support if, if you want to do filler and those kind of things, that's all fine, but you don't need to. They really want someone who's different and everybody's unique look has a space in this industry now. So when you're thinking of applying to modeling agencies, I think 
an iPhone photo is actually all you need. I think it's once you get signed to the agency to get bookings, that's when the professional photos, those come more into play. But to get signed to an agency, they want to see you in your natural state iPhone photo is actually the best way to go. Things have changed. It's insane. Yeah, I would say so. But I would disagree that you're you're not a, just a normal girl <laughs> in a room. I would say that you are quite beautiful and that you would stand out in just about any crowd. Um, Thank you. As, so walking then through the next step of the process, you mentioned once you get signed with an agency and as you try to build a portfolio to get hired for jobs. Um, those photograph sessions, for example, who pays for those? Does the agency pay for those? Should the model himself or herself pay for those? What is the expectation? Yeah, it's it's actually so interesting to me because I knew nothing coming in. So I obviously expected for it to be like, I need to pay for this. I need to make a big book. I need to get a portfolio full of pictures. It's a lot of the time you are working with a photographer who needs photos and you need photos. So you don't actually pay anybody. It's more so you're working with each other. So this photographer needs people to fill in their book. So maybe they have an idea and inspiration and they need a model for it. And for me, I've actually just met people through social media, through Instagram or whatever it may be, who reach out and say, hey, I have this concept. Would you be interested in modeling for me? And I just say yes, and we both get a win-win. And my agency, they have some photographers who reach out to them and say, hey, we want to do test shoots. And these test shoots are just a way for the photographer to get their photos and for the model to also get photos as well. So it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship, if you will. So it's just a win-win for both people. Wow. So you don't have to do anything, basically. Okay. So, and, and would you caution people? Because, you know, as an investigative journalist, it broke my heart how many times I would go and do a story with some person, uh, usually a mom who was trying to get her daughter into modeling and they really just got ripped off. Like they signed with what they thought was a legitimate agency, but then they had to pay for modeling classes, they had to pay for the photographer. There was so much money out of pocket um, that wound up really not turning into anything. Um, do, is there a cautionary tale there for people who, you know, might get ripped off? Yes. I think a lot of the times these agencies on their site will even say, don't respond to emails sent from anyone that's not from this agency, a lot of those kind of things. But I think at the end of the day, you have to be very intentional with who you are willing to work with. So if you're coming across people asking you to pay money to work for them, like that should just be a red flag in and of itself. The way modeling has changed in today's day and age is insane. It's, you can be a normal person found off the streets and someone will pay you thousands of dollars for a shoot. You don't have to invest in modeling classes. It's not something that you need to, I think, kind of like improve on unless you're doing runway modeling. Runway modeling, I would say, is a completely different sector where, yes, you might have to do training classes and it's a lot more nitty gritty and there's sometimes height requirements, but there's a lot of shorter girls actually getting into it, which is great. But when it comes to modeling, there's so much room. There's so much there's so many commercials happening, so many advertisements happening. There is a spot for everyone. So I would just caution people to not be too desperate. Hmm. I think when people are too desperate, they They'll fall for someone's traps and they'll fall for, oh, but I just want to model and I my kid really wants to get into this. Like, I'll just trust whatever. But I don't think you need to. And I think also with social media, always go and check their Instagrams. I mean, there's a real person running that Instagram. Send them a DM and be like, hey, I just applied online. Um, I would love to just talk to you about it because the agents I work with now, I met them on Zoom. And having that personable conversation, I think, is what made it so easy for me to sign with them. Whereas the agency before it was, and I can't name them because <laughs> I just can't, but the agency before I, I had maybe one conversation with them. It was a super big agency and they didn't even know my name on a personal level. So I would just say like, make sure you're building authentic relationships with the agency you're signing with and just take a chance on the people who take a chance on you because at the end of the day, you are the product and you are what's bringing money for the agency. So it shouldn't be that you're investing in something that 
they're supposed to be investing in, like just having confidence in yourself kind of thing. That's very wise. Um, let's talk about clothes because just, you know, in a casual glance of your Instagram feed, I can see that <laughs> there is a bevy of outfits that you cycle through for all these different shoots. Are you personally investing in those clothes? How do, how do the clothes come to you? Who's paying for them? So some a lot of them, in the beginning, I definitely paid for when I was trying to kind of build my Instagram. I would say your Instagram kind of tends to be your portfolio in a way. A lot of casting directors have actually looked at my Instagram and then decided they wanted me for a shoot. But I love fashion. So a lot of the time I'm actually just buying clothes myself. But once I started posting more of my outfit photos and those kind of things, companies started reaching out to me wanting to send me clothes. Like I've been working with Princess Polly now for over a year. And they'll just send me a gift card for X, X, X amount of money. And I can order whatever outfit I want in exchange for a post, which is that's nothing to me. I would love to post a photo in Princess Polly and I get free clothes out of it. So I would say like that's in a sense where you want to invest in yourself. But for me, it was fashion. For other people, it may be beauty. You could do you could invest in makeup and do really cool makeup looks. And then maybe companies like Sephora would reach out to you and want to send you products or to have you model for them as well. That's interesting. So how did how do you think like that company, that clothing company found you? This is the weirdest thing. They I'm not 100% sure, but based on some of my friends who work in PR, they actually have a team who's out scouting micro influencers. And so I know a couple of other friends as well who have worked with Princess Polly and other brands too. And a lot of the time, maybe on the explore page, maybe they type in keywords and they just kind of find you and they think, oh, this is someone who would align with our brand. And maybe their audience has people who would also prefer to buy from the brand. And they have a team who kind of looks for those kind of people. And I would be more on the micro influencer side. I only have like a couple thousand followers, but then the same people will find like a bigger influencer. So one of my friends, she works very closely with lounge and she has about 600,000 followers on Instagram. So obviously she's getting a different deal. She's maybe getting like five grand for a post, whereas I'm just kind of getting free clothes, but yeah, they just, they just find you on Instagram. They just find you if your content is, if you take a photo and kind of make it similar to the kind of photos an influencer is taking, it'll end up on the Explorer page somehow. And if it ends up on the right person's page, then you're good. Are there particular hashtags that you're using that you know are effective? Not me personally. I do know, though, a lot of times I'll even DM brands. So not Princess Polly. Princess Polly found me somehow but other brands i'll even send them a dm and say hey i would love to do a collab and i think i've i can't remember off the top of my head but i think i may have gotten a couple out of that so i would just say reaching out because the worst they can do is say no and if they say no you didn't lose anything and if they say yes you get free clothes first of all i just love everything about you i love that you have this confidence to reach out that way and you know be the person who initiates a conversation like i think that's been a big part of your success is sort of just your willingness to be a self-starter. It definitely has. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. They say, a lot of girls will message me saying, how do you get into modeling? I really want to get into modeling. And the best advice I can give you is apply. You can't do anything unless you apply. And the worst that will happen is you get rejected by one agency and maybe 11 and maybe 100. But there will be that one agency that will say yes and take a chance on you. Do you have somebody, as you evaluate different jobs that come your way, do you have somebody that reviews the contracts that are provided to you before you sign them? Like, how carefully are you um, reviewing those? Yeah, my agents, they handle all of that. And we have a pretty small team, but it's growing. So a team of maybe six to seven. And they look over all the contracts and they communicate it with me ahead of time. And I've already kind of given them my boundaries, if you will. So I refuse to do any nude, partial nudity, any revealing kind of modeling just for my personal values and like my family's values and those kind of things. So they know that if there's anything in the contract that has that, then to like bring that up with me. Um, funnily enough, I actually just had an offer with Victoria's Secret that I had to turn down just because of something I'm not comfortable doing. But you can always say no. And my agents and me, we talk a lot, like at least once a week. I mean, we just text and they know what I'm looking for. So they handle all the contracts and I trust them to do that. And they're kind of trained to do that. So 
I just leave it up to them. That's fascinating. You turned down an offer from Victoria's Secret. And I mean, that's amazing that you are holding on to your principles, that that's just something that you're not interested in doing, at least at this point. Yeah. And I think, well, with that, it was more so they, it was a perfume thing or something. And I had, I just asked, is there going to, like, what's the dress, what's the dress looking like? And they said, oh yeah, it's going to be a bit of this. So maybe it's not good for us to kind of do this with you. So I was like, yeah, that's not going to work. But you just have to stick true to yourself and pray that the next one is something you can do. <laughs> um, when you have done, you know, just in the last couple of years, I think you've done Sephora and you've done Ulta. Can you walk us through a little bit what those experiences are like? Um, are they happening at like the world headquarters or, you know, take like if I was a fly on the wall, take us through that experience of having the chance to model for Sephora and Ulta, which are obviously huge names in cosmetics. Yeah. And there's actually more to come later this year. So definitely stay tuned. Lots of big ones coming out soon. I just can't talk about them. But it's so funny because you just you don't get any information until the week of. And this is modeling for anything. You get a hold for the for the shoot maybe two or three weeks in advance maybe a week in advance so you have to hold that day for the shoot they don't tell you the location or your call time until sometimes two days the day before which is super frustrating especially if you're trying to kind of plan the commute i mean if i'm coming from the bay to la i would prefer to know in advance and all those kind of things and i was in school at the time so i'd also have to balance it with my classes but you get told the shoot location maybe two three days before and your call time two or three days before and then you show up at the time. So say they want you to show up at nine o'clock. A lot of the times you're at a studio. So I've done it at Milk Studios in LA, a couple other studios, which names I just can't remember, but it's just usually a studio. So a big empty warehouse looking room and the production company will bring in like all these big cameras and the big flashing lights, all of that. And then you kind of just go there for like two, three hours of your shoot and then you just go on your day. But one of them, I did Nike. I did Nike and Dick's Sporting Goods. That was kind of an onset location. So we went to this random YMCA basketball court. And that was actually one of the like most fun shoots I've ever done because one, it was basketball related and I grew up playing basketball. So it was full circle for me. And we were modeling WNBA jerseys. So we went into this like deserted YMCA basketball court and they brought in these like really big cameras on, on, what are they called? Hoverboards. So the production agency is on hoverboards, r running around with these cameras, just filming us playing basketball. And then last minute, the, the director, Rashad Floyd, he's amazing. He was like, let's just walk around the street and do some candid shots. So we are walking the streets of this like little Los Angeles, like suburb, suburb, and we're filming. And that was the, that was the content that actually ended up being on Dick Sporting Goods website. So it's a bunch of random stuff sometimes. A lot of times just an empty warehouse with a black like background or something. And some like I think the Nike and like the the sporting goods ones are a bit more fun because you kind of get to go somewhere. But yeah, all of the beauty stuff I've done has just been like an empty warehouse where you just bring all the production stuff. That is fascinating. And so when you show up to the shoot, I'm assuming you show up with no makeup on and your hair is just washed and dried or what do you, what are you expected to do as you arrive? So my first shoot, I brought my entire makeup kit because I was convinced nobody was going to know how to do makeup for my skin tone. Just based on like horror stories I've heard, I pre-straightened my hair. My hair is naturally a bit wavy and I brought, I brought everything I needed. But Oddly enough, yeah, they were like, oh, actually, next time, you know, you can just come with a bare face. We have everything you need. And they do. They had my exact shade of foundation. They had um, they had hair products for curly hair and straight hair. When I went to Ulta, I went with my hair straight because I was convinced that they were just not going to like curly hair. And they were like, they were like, OK, we're going to wash your hair for the prep. And I was like, don't do that. It's going to it's going to go curly. And they were like, oh, we like curly. So that was super cool to see. And then. Yeah, but basically you just show up with not even a water bottle. They provide water. They provide lunch. You literally show up with you, yourself, your bare face, and whatever hair, like, naturally just washed and cleaned, and they kind of just handle it for you. That sounds like a lot of fun, that aspect of it. I think a lot of women <laughs> would be really into having that done. Um, 
if you're comfortable, let's talk a little bit about money. Um, and just generally, like, is this something that you see yourself doing to support yourself in the future? Or is the money that you're making right now, even with these national and international campaigns, is it really just kind of more of a side hustle for you? I think for me, I'm blessed. Um, I did get like a full four year college education. So I have a full time job as an analyst. But so for me, I prefer to keep it as a side hustle more so because I don't want it to take away the fun if I end up making it full time. I'm kind of scared about that. And I have just so much I want to do career wise. I'm not so sure I can make the commitment. However, a lot of girls I've met, a lot of model friends I've met, they do this full time and it is so easy to do it full time. Once you start booking, I mean, you just don't stop booking and it's definitely it pays well enough to make a living off of. I mean, if you get if you get two gigs a month, you're more than set for the month for rent, utilities, all of that kind of stuff. So it's something that definitely pays well. I think it's just a matter of you need to start getting bookings and it doesn't happen as quick in the beginning. It's more of like a what's it called? Exponential growth kind of thing. So maybe you get like the first I got two that first month and then I went like two months, didn't get anything. And then I got another one. And then I was more intentional and said, like, I only want to be doing beauty fashion. I didn't want to do I had a commercial with United Airlines, but I wasn't interested in doing that. I was more intentional with just wanting fashion and beauty. So, yeah, then it kind of had like a bit of a period where I just didn't have anything. And then ever since October, it's been picking up like once a month I'm getting gigs. And I think if I really made the move out to L.A., it would be a lot more frequent. But it's definitely something you could do full time. I think for me personally, don't know that I'm looking to do it full time, full time, just quite yet. But I think it's something that if someone was interested, they could totally make this their full time gig, live off of it and then some like still travel. <laughs> and and, that, and that's kind of my question, too, is how much does geography factor into all of this? If somebody is watching this and they're from some small town somewhere in the US, is there a chance that they could still break into this? Or um, if they were serious about it, like you're saying, do they really need to move to a larger city like Los Angeles or New York to launch their career? Yeah, I actually, I know this girl, she was at um, a shoot I did with Rose Inc. and she's signed in four or six different countries, I can't remember, but the, the, the caveat with that is you have to pay for your own travel. So if you're say, say you're living in like North Carolina, but you're signed in New York, then you would just have to make the commitment that when a shoot comes along, you would travel from North Carolina to New York and you'd have to cover the cost of that travel. But you could still essentially get gigs. I think COVID has helped us with that because now there's online and virtual um, castings. Whereas before all castings were in person. I think before there was no way you would have to move to LA to make it work. But now you have the luxury of saying, can I just audition virtually? You can send in a video to the casting directors. I think it might make it a bit harder to get gigs that way. And I think that's why having like a social media platform is helpful because they can get to know you more personally. So if you can't attend an in-person casting, you just have to make sure you're showcasing your personality through that casting video or something like that. I think it's beneficial to move to wherever your agency is located. I know that there's also um, agencies in like random little pockets of like like Chicago. I think I have a friend signed out there. There's there's definitely ways to work around it. But I think if you're trying to make this your full time, trying to pay the bills, it might just be the easiest option to move to wherever your agency is. So even um, help me understand that, because as I'm trying to protect people for, from paying for costs that they shouldn't pay for, even larger campaigns, like you're saying, often if there is travel involved because you don't live in the city where the shoot is taking place you can expect to be paying for the travel expenses to get there yeah definitely and i've had to pay for travel expenses because i'm signed in la but live out of sf so that's been something that i've had to kind of cover myself but i will say the the check they're giving you will cover travel costs and then some so you're not really so say like just to be completely candid say that the check was 4,000 for that shoot. And then the travel is maybe like 500, really. If you're flying, a lot of the time I would fly in in the morning, fly out the same day because I didn't want to pay for a hotel. So I'd be very cautious of the fact that I want to save this much money. So then maybe your net profit is really 3,500 and then you think about taxes and all that, but whatever. But that's still a lot, a lot of money to make in one day of filming. I mean, 
it takes me two weeks to make that much at my day job. So if you can make that a day, I mean. And to clarify again, your day job is what? An analyst? Yeah. <laughs> like a financial analyst. Like a business analyst. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you Brains and beauty. I absolutely love it. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to divulge that would help people who are thinking about this? And namely, I'm, I'm wondering, like, what are you doing now to further your education in this field? Because I am assuming that, you know, with that beautiful brain of yours, you want to keep learning and growing. What, are you, what do you study to get better at this so-called craft? I think it's, it's honestly a thing of confidence. So when I did Nike, I would say I definitely lacked confidence, but I learned a lot from this model that was there. Her name is Eden Hoogveld. She was just killing it. I think the biggest thing you could improve on when it comes to modeling is just loving yourself in front of the camera. I mean, before I was super shy, a bit timid, and casting directors see through that. Like you have to come up, you have to come to this shoot knowing that you are the product and that people love to see you. And you have to have that confidence. So it's more so like you have to change your entire outlook on life and on your day to day. You have to remember that this is your life and you only get one shot at this life and no one really cares what you're doing. So you might as well show up to that photo shoot, get in front of the camera and just be silly, be embarrassing. It doesn't matter. It's not really something you can read in a book. It's really self-love. And I've actually been reading books on self-love and self-help. So, I mean, you can read books on it, but I think it comes, it just comes down to the fact that you have to believe in yourself for someone else to believe in you. Because if you don't believe in you and you're shy to even apply to modeling agencies, I mean, how are you ever going to get into it? You literally just have to have confidence and work at building the confidence. And that'll exude through the shoot, through the campaign or whatever else it is you're doing anyway. Mm. That's great advice. All right, Sanjana, thank you so much. We will definitely include information on how to contact you for those who are watching and want to learn more. But uh, thanks for your insight and for being on that expert show. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh, she is such a doll. I love her. Uh, we will certainly create a tip sheet based on all the great information that she shared. We'll be posting that on thatexpertshow.com. If you want to go back and watch previous episodes, we always put them on our YouTube channel. Just search for That Expert Show. Uh, we also put our show out as a podcast. So wherever it is that you listen to podcasts, do a search for That Expert Show and subscribe to those. I love hearing from you. I love getting your feedback on who I should interview or topics that I should cover. And uh, so I am on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just look for Anna Canzano and join the conversation because some of my best ideas and feedback come from you, come from the audience, and that is the beauty of the show. We're on Monday nights live at 7 p.m. via The Oregonian, a partnership with them. And uh, thanks to all of you that have contributed to the show. We'll see you next time on That Expert Show, where you help run the show.